Father, we marvel at your great love for sinners like us, and we know what kind of love that it is and that it is not. It's not a love that is conditioned upon our performance, that we might earn your love, that we might demonstrate our worthiness of it. Lord, it is just the opposite. We are rebels who would plot your death if you came near to us just like they did in the first century. Those kinds of people are not worthy of love. We are not worthy of it. And yet, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. You demonstrated your love toward us in that. And we entrust ourselves to you yet again all over that we might live a life that is um, oriented toward you, that continues to see your trustworthiness. Lord, may we, as we take one step after another in this new life that you have given to us, may we be confident, not self-confident, may we turn from that, but be confident in you and what you have done, that we would yield ourselves to you, that we would be people known as entrusting ourselves to to a God who does what is right. Whatever may come our way, whatever blessings may come, whatever losses may take from us, may we be people who humbly entrust ourselves to you and remain under this great love that you have shown us and continue to show us. And it's in your son's great name we pray. Amen. Let's take our Bibles this morning, and you need to be uh, able to be in two places at once. You can get Romans 6 ready, and as you get Romans 6 ready, I need you to go back to the Old Testament for a moment here at the beginning. I want you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, 1 Samuel chapter 17. So Romans 6 is where we'll be eventually, but I want you to turn to 1 Samuel 17. I want to take you to an amazing battle scene and show you two entirely different postures taken on that, battle, uh, on that battlefield. Uh, the scene is the battle found in 1 Samuel 17 when the armies of Israel under King Saul stood on one side of the valley and the Philistines stood on the other side and the Philistines' champion Goliath came out for 40 days, 40 days he came out and he taunted Israel and he taunted Yahweh. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, I'm going to read just a little bit and you can follow along, starting in verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and they camped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Damim. Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span was nine feet, nine inches tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was clothed with scale armor, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. His armor alone weighed 125 pounds. He also had bronze greaves on his legs and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron, 15 pounds, just the head of the spear. His shield carrier also walked before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, Why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Again, the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And here's the first posture. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed. 
and greatly afraid. Look over at verse 22. By this time, young David has come along. He's bringing lunch for his older brothers who are in the army under King Saul. He's probably 15 to 17 years old. Verse 22, David left his baggage in the care of the baggage keeper, and he ran to the battle line and entered in order to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine from Gath, named Goliath, was coming up from the army of the Philistines, and he spoke these same words. And David heard them. But here's that first posture again. When all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. That was one posture to take on the battlefield that day. Well, what about the opposite posture to that that was taken on the battlefield? And that involves young David. Drop down to verse 26. David spoke to the men who were standing by him saying, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away their reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? No, that's different. Drop down to verse 32. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Then Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth while he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and attacked him. I rescued it from his mouth, and when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard. I struck him, and I killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Look over now at verse 45. David finally goes out as the man to stand against Goliath. Verse 45, then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have taunted. This day, the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down And I will remove your head from you, and I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands." Then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David. I love this. Watch this that David ran. David ran quickly. David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into his bag and he took from it a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And he struck the Philistine and killed him. That's quite a different posture toward the battle. What was the same for both Saul and his army and what was the same for David? Well, it was the same Goliath. It was the same threats, the same taunts. It was the same stature and strength In Goliath, it was the same valley, it was the same battlefield. There was a lot that was the same. But what was different? The armies of Israel were oriented toward fear. And David had a Godward orientation. He seemed to be more aware of Yahweh on the battlefield than Goliath. And and even his own small, young stature. On the side of the armies of Israel was doubt and fear. And what was different was on David's side was a remarkable trust and confidence in Yahweh. 
that same Goliath just didn't look the same through the eyes of confident trust in the Lord. Goliath appeared to be more, in David's eyes, like the victim, the trapped prey, not the hunter coming after David. That was the right way to see the battle that day. What a difference that Godward orientation and faith made in that battle. You see, who Yahweh was, what Yahweh had promised Israel, what he had achieved for them, what Yahweh was capable of, postured David to stand completely differently toward the battle compared to the armies of Israel. It wasn't merely that David knew that, though, knew Yahweh. Yahweh had to be believed. He had to be trusted. He had to be yielded to. That was what David did. He was a yielded man to Yahweh. Now, as you take your Bible and you turn to the right and follow the progress of progressive revelation, we find the greater son of David, Jesus, fighting a a much greater battle on our behalf against a much greater foe than Goliath. And he fought that battle not in a valley, but he fought it on a cross and in a tomb that is now empty. And what a yielded man Jesus of Nazareth was. He kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. That was a posture of faith and trust. Over and over he kept saying, I have not come to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And what we're learning is that his kingly grace that reigns achieved for us who believe him some staggering benefits through union with him in his death and in his resurrection. We're learning all this in Romans chapter 6. What we find is his kingly grace actually postured us to be standing on our own battlefield. It is the sanctification battlefield where we fight for holiness, where we fight for obedient living to Jesus Christ. And what we've been asking ourselves as believers, saved by grace, believers who are well positioned for our battle against indwelling sin, what we've been asking ourselves is what kind of posture are we going to take on the battlefield for sanctification? One possibility is to take the posture that's oriented toward fear and even dread. I just just don't want to fight this anymore. I'm getting clobbered. That posture in your fight against indwelling sin, it, it makes you feel cornered. It makes you feel trapped. It makes you feel like you're the victim. It makes you feel like you're the hunted, the prey. The other option, which is the only option for the believer, is to take the posture. It's the only option that you should take. It's not to say that we don't ever slip into that other one, but you know what I mean. This is the only one for us to take, the legitimate one. The other posture is one that's oriented towards God in his grace and what his grace has achieved for us in our union with Christ crucified, with Christ buried, and our union with Christ raised from the dead. That posture is quite different in your fight against sin because it is a posture of confidence, not in yourself. It is a posture of trust in the Lord. It is a a posture that makes you become proactive, not reactive. The armies of Israel were reactive. Young David was proactive, eager. It's a posture for us that makes us eager to even run toward the battle of sanctification every day. That posture makes you feel like you're not the victim. 
but you know the tables have been turned and you are the hunter. Which posture defines you more these days if you're a believer in Jesus Christ? And what we're learning in Romans 6 is that what makes all of the difference between those two opposite postures is Romans 6. But, but Romans 6 has to do more than just exist because it exists. The existence of Romans 6 doesn't make the difference. It's do you know these things, believer? But even that's not enough to make the difference that you know it. Because what makes the difference is a yielded life to it. A life of faith, a life of entrustment. A life of confidence in what grace has achieved for you. I want to read our passage again. Remember the gospel in Romans chapter 6 is defending grace against two slanderous charges. Um, and we are in the first defense of grace. The first defense of grace is in verses 1 to 14, and we're right in the middle of all that. So I'm going to read verses 1 to 14. You can follow as I read. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self is crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Because he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, watch these words, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died... He died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts, and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness. To God. This is the first defense of grace that the gospel gives. Verses 1 and 2 summarize the defense, and we, we're putting it this way. Grace, number one, in no way is in partnership. There's no way that grace is in alliance with sin. That was the first slanderous accusation against grace. Well, grace seemed to benefit when sin was there in justification, and you, it, grace didn't even make you address the sin. It just said, believe. And so God justifies the ungodly. He doesn't justify the one who's trying to make himself better with works. So grace is unconcerned with sin was the slanderous charge. In fact, maybe it's even in some kind of a mutually beneficial partnership with sin because as sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And the gospel's first defense is this. Grace in no way is in partnership with sin in the believer's life. And if that's the case then grace is helping you to fight against sin in your life, believer. Therefore, grace is fight against sin in the believer, and we've been taking these one by one. So let me just review through the first five. We've covered all of these. You can go back and listen to these online if you want. Therefore, grace is fight against sin in the believer, first, is a matter of death and life for me. You have died to sin, and therefore you cannot live the same old way you used to. Verse 2. Your relationship to sin was changed by dying to it. Death is a relationship changer. Therefore, grace's fight against sin in the believer requires me to investigate and know grace's achievements, number two. Over and over throughout this whole section, it's knowing this. Do you not know? Knowing this. Do you not know? You have to know these things. 
Grace is fight against sin in the believer. Number three is rooted in my union with Christ. We are not fighting against sin while Jesus is over there somewhere away from us watching. No, we somehow have union with him in, in his crucifixion. We are united with him in his burial. We are united with him here raised from the dead. And our fight and the battle takes place foundationally from that union with him. Fourthly, grace's fight against sin in the believer broadcasts my changed relationship to sin through baptism. Public water baptism was one of the very first things that believers did in the New Testament. And going under the water and coming out of the water reenacted a death and a resurrection, raised to new life. It was a pronouncement made, it was a proclamation made, it was a broadcast made publicly that my relationship to sin changed. I want everybody to know that. I want that to be clear. I'm not a part of you all anymore that I used to live with. We used to sin in solidarity together, and I'm not with you anymore. I'm with Jesus Christ, and I'm with these people. I died. I've been raised with him. I am a new person. My relationship to sin has changed. Water baptism does not accomplish that changed relationship to sin. It simply broadcasts it. So if grace is in cahoots with sin, why on earth would it have you pronounce that at the very beginning? Publicly, it doesn't. It's not in cahoots with your sin. Number five, grace's fight against sin in the believer assures me that my union with Christ is complete and freed me from slavery to sin, verses five to seven. Verse five, if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. It was impossible for Jesus to be crucified and buried and put a period there. There was a comma, a three-day comma, and he rose from the dead. Jesus is one Jesus, a crucified Jesus, buried Jesus, raised from the dead Jesus. If you get united with him in his death, you get union with him in always resurrection and even ascension, Ephesians chapter 2. You have the full benefits of your complete union with Christ. And verses five to seven focused on that being freedom from slavery to sin. Now, we're ready for number six. It's very similar to number five. Therefore, grace's fight against sin in the believer, number six, secures belief that my union with Christ is complete. Not only are we assured that that it's certain that we certainly were, but we now believe it. Our union with Christ was complete. And it provides me irreversible new life, irreversible new life, irreversible newness of life. Look at verse 8 now. Paul is transitioning us to cycle back through our union with Christ once again. He just did that in verses 5 to 7. The point is to build on how certain, how sure, how trustworthy our full and complete union with Christ is. We do not have a God who equipped us halfway for our battle against sin. And you can see the language of trust and confidence and faith in verse 8. Now, if we have believed Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. If we have died with Christ, and there is no doubt if we have or not, we believe we shall also live with him. Future tense. This is the future tense of certainty. It's a reality now based on the condition that has been met that we were crucified with Christ. The point is, is that our union with Christ is inseparable because Christ could not be pulled apart. He is one Christ who was crucified, buried, and raised. Since he didn't just die, but also inseparably rose from the dead, our union with him can't only go halfway but we reap the grace benefits of that full union with him in both his death and his resurrection. We believe that. That's not like saying, I'll believe I'll have another Coke at lunch today. No, we believe that. We entrust ourselves to that. We yield ourselves to this reality. We bank on it. We cast what we know of ourselves on it. And so this union achievement of grace, it's not up for debate anymore, believer, especially on the battlefield of sanctification. 
can you imagine what effect it would have on you, on, on the posture you would take to doubt this in the face of sin? How could you ever hope to fight successfully against your indwelling sin when you doubt if your union with Christ was fully assembled? Do I really have all of the benefits? There's no justification for a shaky confidence in your union with Christ. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Our confidence in verse 8, the yielding of ourselves to this in verse 8, the entrusting of ourselves in verse 8 to our complete union with Christ is full of knowing this fact spelled out in verses 9 and 10. We believe, verse 8, knowing something, verse 9. We are not believing our full union with Christ, but doing so from ignorance, Or to put it another way, we are not those who are believing that we have full union with Christ, but then we really don't know how or why we do. Rather, we believe, verse 8, knowing something. Verse 9, what? That it's all about Christ, and it's all about his death, and it's all about his resurrection. Verse 9, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. That's where it begins. Christ, here's the main idea. Christ, dot, 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 is never to die again. That's what we know. The dying he did is over. It happened. It won't ever happen again. Well, how was that possible? Well, having been raised from the dead... Christ is never to die again. So then what does that say about his resurrection? It says at least two things about it. First, here's what it says about his resurrection. His being raised by the glory of the Father, mentioned in verse 4, it's an affirmation of Jesus. What he achieved in his death is affirmed in his resurrection. Otherwise, the glory of the Father would have what? Either not raised them up, or only raised him up, resuscitated him to do it all over again. Let's try this again, son, and let's see if we can get this right the second time you die. How absurd. Just the opposite. His resurrection was an affirmation that his death achieved everything it was to achieve. He was not resuscitated to try again, but resurrected to never die again. His resurrection is an affirmation of him. Secondly, his resurrection was not just an affirmation, but it was powerful. It was powerful to keep him from never becoming susceptible to death again. His resurrection was powerfully irreversible. His resurrection is both affirming and powerfully irreversible. That's the rock-solid guarantee that he will never die again. His resurrection was fatal to death. The finality of his resurrection, it emphasizes in the strongest terms possible, and it certifies the decisive breach that it made with his death. Again, Jesus wasn't resuscitated back to an old life. He was resurrected forward to an indestructible life. Never to die again. What then does that say about Christ's relationship toward death? Romans 6, 9, the end of it. Death no longer is master over him. Now you need to understand, and you know this, death is still a master to countless others. But Jesus... Having been raised from the dead, he stands toward death unlike he did before. He will never announce again to his disciples that I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be crucified, and I'm going to die. He'll never announce that again. Death no longer is master over him because Jesus has an indestructible life. 
To say that death no longer is master over him, it means that at one point it obviously what? It did have mastery over him. On the cross, Jesus said it was finished. He breathed his last and he laid down his life with his own authority and death mastered him decisively. Surrounding him down on the ground were professional executioners who went up to him and thrust a spear into his side and there was no pain-driven wince from it. The professional executioners knew he was dead. They didn't have to break any bones. He was dead and death was master in that moment. He was wrapped with burial wrappings, including a face cloth over his face. It would have made breathing difficult for anybody who was alive, but he was truly dead. Death was master in that moment. And he was placed in a tomb, and a rock was rolled over the face of it, and it was sealed with a Roman seal. He was dead, and death was master in that moment. And that is actually something very distressing to the believer. Think on it. Listen to what this one commentator said. He said, it is a terrible thing to contemplate that death once held the prince of life, the Lord of all. Behold at the tomb, the Lord of life under the dominion of death. All for you, believer. All for us. But Christ was raised from the dead with an irreversible resurrection. And what that meant for Jesus was that death was in the rearview mirror, getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, moment by moment, as he sped forward into his resurrection life. His resurrection is the guarantee that when he left the grave, he left death's dominion and jurisdiction forever. Now, death might want to extradite him back, but it has no authority to do so because Jesus is a different Jesus than he was before. He has irreversible resurrection life. And this is the one whom believers are in union with. The one who did submit himself under death's lordship. The one who, having been raised from the dead, will never fall out of heaven from the right hand of the Father back into the tomb. He is the one that we have full union with. The one who in no way can ever be mastered by death's lording ways again. We are in complete union, not half union, complete union with that formerly dead but now forever raised Savior. Notice verse 10. It is because of what Paul says in verse 10 that he can say death has no more mastery over Jesus. So why is death no longer master over him, verse 9? Well, for... Or because the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. The death that he died, it wasn't just any kind of death. Do you understand this? It wasn't just any kind of death. It's not the the same death that the criminals on the cross on either side of him died. The death he died wasn't just any kind of death. It was a very specific kind of death. What kind of death was it? a death in which he died to sin once for all. When Christ went under the dominion of death at the cross, an empty tomb, he died to sin. Now, where have we heard that statement before? Died to sin. It's said about us, right? Remember in verse 2, look back up there. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Remember, death is many things, but foundationally in chapter 6, it means a radical relationship change. Our relationship to sin has changed because we're dead to it. 
Well, now we're told Jesus' death was a death in which he died to it. So notice that it was actually Jesus' relationship to sin that changed first, foundationally, and then our union with him, with him and his death, that meant our relationship to sin also changed. Now, we need to rightly understand what kind of relationship Jesus had to sin, don't we? Because he's not like us. We came into this world in intimate relationship with our own indwelling sin. But when the Son of God took on flesh, he did so without any sin. So how on earth then did he enter into any kind of relationship with sin? And and believer, you know the answer. Right? 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin. He had no relationship to sin personally. But God made him who knew no sin to what? Not be with sin, but an even closer relationship to actually what? Be sin for you, for me. That is a union with sin. That's a relationship with sin. Staggering. Our sin was inseparable from him there. That was his relationship to sin. And when he died, his death wasn't just any kind of death, but it was one in which he died to sin. His relationship to sin was forever changed. Look at verse 10. For the death that he died, he died to sin what? Once for all. So how many times is he going to do this death to sin? Just once. No more. It's over. It's like the never again of verse 9. He is to die never again. So again, when he took on sin at the cross and he died, and he died to sin, he was not resuscitated in order to try once again to defeat sin. Rather, what He intended to achieve at the cross with our sin upon him was entirely effective such that death could come and death could come and change his relationship to sin once for all. He'll never have to personally take it on again. Listen to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once and after this comes judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, he will appear a second time for salvation. But right here, without reference to sin. His relationship to sin that he had and took care of in his first coming is done. He never has to enter into some kind of a personal relationship with it again. Oh, he will deal with every sin. And anybody else. But he died to sin once and for all. Death. The one who, and the one who had the power of death, the devil. They may have thought that death was swallowing up the Savior, but do you know what God was doing? What was God doing with this death? What God was doing was using his death to change his relationship to sin forever. And so the primary point here in his death is not that he died for our sins. He did that. Romans 5 makes that clear, and so many other passages make that clear. But the point being made in Romans 6 is not that he died for our sins, but what we're doing is is we're adding to that idea that he also died to sin Sin in relation to the resurrected Jesus is in the rearview mirror and it's growing smaller and smaller as he speeds forward into resurrection life. And he is the one that we are in complete union with as believers. And so all of the benefits intended for us, they flow to us from that union. Then our union with him in his death to sin means our own radically changed relationship to sin. If he does not have to face it personally ever again, if it's finished for him, 
then how can our union with him in that death not change our relationship also in the intended way that grace planned? Now, so far in verses 8 or 9 and 10 here, we've been primarily looking back at the, at the negatives, so to speak, about death and sin. Death is done for Jesus. Sin is, is, is done for Jesus. He's dead to it in the way that he is dead to it. It's forever behind, out of the reach. It's gone. But, but what about looking forward? Verse 10, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Just like the death that he died wasn't just any kind of death, it's also true that the life that he now lives isn't just any kind of life but it is a life that he lives to God. Do you see the opposites in verse 10? Dying and death on one side and life and living on the other side. And Do you see dying to sin on one side and living to God on the other side? So death and dying, opposite of life and living, sin on one side, God on the other his death here was oriented toward changing his relationship to sin once and for all, and his life is now oriented toward God in every way. He is at the right hand of the Father. That life toward God will never crumble and crash back toward sin and death. Again, in no way possible can resurrected Jesus, who has ascended to the right hand of his Father, never can he fall out of that life toward God back into the tomb. And believer, you are united to that one. That one. So how can your union with that one not change you? leave you like you were without him in sin. Verse 8, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. This is your confidence, believer. He is your confidence. Here's your trust. Here's your confidence in your fight against sin. Like Jesus once and for all is done with death and sin. Like he is in a forever changed relationship to sin and, and in an irreversible, indestructible life toward God. You believe you shall also live with him if indeed you died with him. As certain as his life toward God is, so is your life with him something completely believable. You know it, verse 9. You know what's true for him in his death and resurrection. Therefore, your complete union with him is completely believable. You have irreversible new life. Irreversible. And this is grace's strategy for you in its fight against your indwelling sin, that it would secure for you belief and confidence, a sure yielding of yourself in this complete union with Christ. Grace's strategy for you is that you be absolutely confident on the battlefield of sanctification. You are not confident in yourself. You are scared of yourself. But you are confident in what the grace of God has achieved for you in your union with Christ, crucified, buried, and raised from the dead. The implications are huge. Be confident in what it has achieved for you. In this paragraph, primarily verses 8 to 10, what has it achieved for you? Irreversible new life. Irreversible. You are by God's grace an irreversibly new person alive with Christ. Galatians 2.20, what did Paul say? I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, 
but Christ lives in me. It is no, wait, how is this? It is no longer I who live, but there's a me in which Christ lives. Well, the old man was crucified with Christ. And there's this new life that's in union with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And this life that I now live in the flesh, I live by what? Fear. Oh, faith. I, I believe this to be true. He's the one who loved me and he gave himself up for me. And, and the point in Romans 6, verses 8 to 10, confidence, faith, belief, trust. This is indeed the reality you know to be true about Jesus in his death and resurrection. What? What kind of believer has grace positioned us to be on the sanctification battlefield? Do you have the posture of a, of a fearful believer? A believer dreading the fight? Is that what God's grace achieved for us? To be Ignorant believers, unaware of what on earth is happening. How did I get here? What, how do I fight this? That is not what grace achieved. Do you not know? Paul says, rather grace has positioned us on the sanctification battlefield to be just the opposite, to be, to be certain. Surely, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, verse 5. We believe that we shall also live with him. It's a complete union with Christ that we have. We can be confident in that. We can be eager in that. We can be proactive in this fight. What more, what more, what more could God in his grace have done to posture us for that? Grace's fight against sin in us, believer number six, secures belief that union with Christ is complete and it provides irreversible new life. Listen, grace did not take the old you and then dust that old you off a bit and then send that same old you back to deal with your sin again. Grace seized you with a kingly grip and united you to Christ crucified, united you with Christ buried, and united you with Christ raised from the dead. And we've been saying this, you now are not the same person you used to be in the presence of those same sins. But we get to add this as well. You are also not the same person you used to be in the presence of the same God. It's a new you. You are a new creature positioned by grace to stand sure and to stand confident in new life with God against sin on the battlefield of sanctification. Do you believe that? And now aware of all that you are by grace's doing, fully persuaded that grace never compromised with sin in any way, that grace never formed some kind of an unholy alliance with it, that grace never made peace with your sin, but instead being fully aware that grace instead has taken aggressive action against your sin, that you have all of the provisions and benefits necessary to face the battle against sin because you're completely unified with Christ in every way. Now you are ready for your first command from grace. Number seven. Grace's fight against sin in the believer, number seven, commands me. Now let that just sink in for a moment. Grace commands me. It does. There's a lot of funny ideas about what grace is and what grace does and what it doesn't do. Grace commands me. It commands me to take my death to sin and life toward God as settled fact. Verse 11, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That consider yourselves is an imperative. Present tense. 
Even so, that helps finish the thought that if all of this is true for Jesus in his death and his resurrection, then for the one who is united fully with Jesus, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That is to be your first active expression of faith, believer, on the battlefield. Consider it. This is the demonstration of your unshakable confidence on the battlefield. This is the fruit of your faith in grace's achievement in you through your union with Christ. Consider yourselves dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The, the verb consider, it, it begins certainly with counting, calculating, reckoning with the fact that you are indeed in a complete union with Christ. It starts there. But you must take it a step further and account for and reckon with and calculate what the implication is for you from that union, and that is that you are dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. I think the clearest way to understand this is to take it as a settled fact. That's what it means to consider it. Take it as a settled fact that you are dead to sin and that you are alive to God in Christ Jesus. Reckon with this to the extent that you don't doubt it any longer. If you're constantly, present tense, always considering and taking this as a settled fact, it's hard for doubt to get in there. Based on all that has been achieved for you by grace in verses 1 to 10, fully affirm this, that you are dead to sin and you are alive to God in Christ Jesus. Register this as indeed your reality until any thoughts of a return to your old sin habits and patterns becomes absolutely unthinkable to you. Moment by moment, take it as a settled fact. That's what the present tense would indicate. Don't let yourself ever lose sight of these implications for you on the battlefield. Never get in any sin situation on the battlefield where you wouldn't be settled about being dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Because if that ever happens, in that moment, you'll be at your weakest. And being dead to sin but alive to God, these two are in contrast. That means you can't both listen you can't both live in sin like you used to without Christ and be alive to God in Christ. You can't do both of those things at the same time. There has come such a breach between your old self with sin and who you are anew in Christ. Are, are you settled about that, believer? A complete rupture a definitive break, a decisive breach has occurred between your former relationship with sin and your new life orientation toward God. Are you settled about that? The divide is real. Take it as a settled fact every moment of every day. Moment by moment, you must be taking this as a settled fact. Your best postured for the sanctification battle when you are in the moment settled beyond a shadow of a doubt that you indeed are not the same person toward that sin you're facing, but also that you are not the same person in the presence of God whom you live toward. You are alive to him. Are you settled about that, believer? You're alive to God in Christ, you are awakened to him in Christ. You are spiritually invigorated toward him in Christ. You don't despise him anymore. You desire him in Christ. You are responsive to him, not rebellious towards him. You're sensitive toward him, unlike you ever were before. And you have your best chance on the battlefield when you take that as settled fact 
There are more commands that come after this first one. But your action on the battlefield as a believer, confident in the achievements of grace on your behalf, it begins here. And this command to consider, to take as a settled fact your being dead to sin and being alive to God in Christ, this command is the doorway that you must decisively and confidently open so that you are positioned better for the other commands to come. You see, if that doesn't happen, if you don't take your death to sin and you're being alive to God in Christ as settled fact, it's difficult to see just how you're going to, in the next verse, keep sin from reigning in your mortal body. Why would you keep it from getting to the throne in your life if you're not settled about the fact? It's difficult to see just how you'll not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. It's difficult to see how you'll be able to present yourself wholly to God as one alive from the dead. It begins with this command, to take as a settled fact that you are dead to sin and you are alive to God in Christ. So what is your posture on the battlefield of sanctification? Indifferent? Fearful? Do you dread the fight? Or are you confident? Not in yourself. Are you hopeful? Are you even eager? And do you see the difference that Romans 6 makes? But, but not just Romans 6 existing, but, but knowing what Romans 6 means and says and the implications for you, but not just knowing them, but do you see the difference that entrusting yourself to it makes, yielding yourself to it, casting everything you know of yourself on these grace achievements, do you see the difference that makes? And now we're learning that, not even that, but do you see the difference that is made by taking it as a settled fact that these things are true for me? Believer, when all of that happens, you have an uncommon posture against indwelling sin these days. It's an uncommon posture to take, but it's the grace-intended posture to take. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, what hope there is for the believer snared by sin. What hope there is. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ that, Lord, you would bring hope to us that we would not be ensnared by sin that we would see all that your grace has achieved for us, that we would seek to know it intimately and that we would entrust ourselves to what you have accomplished through your grace and that we would moment by moment take it as a settled fact that we indeed have a changed relationship towards sin and a changed relationship toward you. What help the body of Christ can give to a member what help we can be to one another. Oh Lord, would you drive these grace achievements home in our heart? Would you help us cling all the more to the gospel's defense of grace? Lord, it is a tricky day out in evangelicalism to understand rightly just what it means to be saved by grace. May Romans 6 help us be a church family that's obedient to you and helpful to one another. And Lord Jesus, what we want more than anything is we want our eyes set upon you, the one who went to the cross for us, the one who went into the tomb for us, the one who came out of the tomb for us the one who has ascended
to your Father's right hand interceding for us, the one who will come for us. We marvel at who you are as our Savior. Help us to lift up our voices in worship of you, that we are alive in you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.